There isn't a single word in the New Testament, not one single word that was written, not one word, without the oppressive, slavish, murderous Roman government in control. Those people were living it when fellow brothers and sisters and Christians were being killed right before their eyes, family members. That was the age that our New Testament was written in. And we sit back thinking, oh, they said something naughty about me. Oh. Yeah. You know what John Hagee says? Get over it. Buck up and get over it and stand strong. So put on the whole armor of God, which is our lesson today. Okay. So been there, done that. I'm not just saying you need to do something I didn't have to face and do too. Okay. Just because I'm out of the workforce doesn't mean we're still not put up with it. Walmart, wherever you go. Idiots. It's a corrupt world. And you said it right. Evil is good and good is evil. That's what we're facing. And we need to pray for unsaved loved ones that they be saved because the Lord's coming. We want them to go up with us. Amen? Amen. Now, I don't mean to put it all down, but this is fresh on my mind. We are living in days of deception. And the world is being deceived. Let us hold fast to truth. We need to take a look at Ephesians, if you would. Turn in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 6. We've got a, a 45 minutes to get to 1030 and talk about a two-hour message. I had hoped uh, I will not uh, stray too far from the lesson but stick with the message because I wanted to do this all in one, one message, have you take this home and re-review it at your leisure. The message or the, the title of the lesson, God's Armor, Biblical Sevens that we're looking at. Uh, in this, I want to focus on the thought that comes from the message and the translation of these passages. God is strong and he wants you strong. God is strong and he wants you strong. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. That's where that phrase comes from. God is strong. He wants you strong. Verse 11. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness in this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. I could spend an entire mess lesson just on that one verse. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand, catch that, in the evil day, having done all to stand. <clears throat> Verse 14, stand therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness. What did we just say a minute ago? Stand. That's, that's where we're at. Okay. Having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace, above all, taking on the shield of faith, which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. And verse 18, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. And then Paul says, and pray for me too. Verse 18, which I would say amen to that. Okay. So we, we back up and we look at these things, uh, truth, righteousness, peace, faith, salvation, and the word. And pray. There's your seven. Seven armaments of, the, of God's uh, armor for us. Ephesians 1, verse 1 says, Paul is an apostle to the saints who are in Ephesus. Like Romans, Ephesians does not focus on the problems that are in the church. It explains some of the greatest themes and doctrines of Christianity. Both of them do. In one way, it's a summary. The book of Ephesians is a summary of everything that Paul has written. First, he talks about Christian theology. Then, he, then the practical application of all of this theology. 
Christian theology is our various doctrines, literally the teachings of our Christian faith then the practical application of our doctrines to the life of the believer. This is where J. Vernon McGee often said, where the rubber meets the road. Take these, these ideas, these, these doctrines, these fundamental teachings, take these philosophies, take this theology, take this teaching, and put it to work in practical everyday life. And that's the two divisions of what the book of Ephesians is about. He's talking about the theology, then he talks about putting it to practice. Finally, he said, my brethren, verse 10, be strong and in the Lord and in the strength of his might. The word finally, Paul here is, concludes all that he has taught up to this point about what God has done for us through sending the Lord Jesus to die for us, rise from the dead, to live in us and to unite us all in him. Jesus said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men to me. You want unity in your family, he's it. He's got to be lifted up. You know, you've got to figure out what's the platform upon which you consider unity in your family. There are some of you that face individuals that hate Protestants. You have individuals that want to promote the agenda that's in the world. And they want you to compromise your stand in order to find unity in the family. You have to make the decision to say, no, I will take a stand for what's true. I will stand for what God's word says. I will stand for the Lord Jesus Christ. You, unfortunately opponent are turning away the greatest gift of love that has ever been offered mankind the person of the Lord Jesus Christ who died for you that your sins be forgiven and that you have eternal life you are turning your back on this I saw a, a girl on Facebook and I couldn't believe that if she was just saying this or if she was really truthful she got onto a uh, Christian uh, site and said leave me alone if I want to go to hell it's my business That was her statement. Quit trying to preach Jesus to me. And I thought, truly? And I thought, th th okay, this is the kind of world we're facing. I don't think, number one, they believe in God. They don't believe in God. They don't believe in hell. They don't believe in eternal consequences. They don't believe in responsibility for their actions. That's the kind of individuals that we face today. Whatever feels good, do it. Whatever I enjoy, I want to do it. And I only want those around me that agree with me that what I want to do is what I ought to do. And anybody that disagrees with that, we need to silence you, put you out of, out of our lives and not have anything more to do with you. That's kind of the world we're living in. Now, he says, we see our part in God's great and majestic plan for man. Since before the creation of the world, now let us grow and conduct ourselves as fully mature children of God. We can do this through infilling power of God's Holy Spirit who dwells in each one of us. The oh, thank you so much. I appreciate that. <clears throat> we can do this through the infilling power of God's Holy Spirit. We can stand as much fully mature Christians in a lost and dying world that is full of corruption and evil because God is strong, he wants us to be strong too, and we can be strong through the Holy Spirit. Now, therefore, ready yourself for a spiritual warfare that is at hand. How do we fight this warfare? With God's spiritual weapons to battle man's spiritual enemy. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, our weapons are not carnal. That means they are not made of flesh. They are not man-made. They are spiritual and they are from God. First, Paul talks about this, uh, our sight. Satan has blinded the eyes of men. One pastor said it takes sight to see light. That sight is a spiritual sight and our inner conscience John Newton wrote, Amazing Grace, I once was blind, but now I see. How was that transpired? By spiritual sight that was given to him through the grace of God. Paul prayed in, one, uh, in chapter 1, verse 17 of Ephesians that God would give the Ephesians spiritual wisdom and insight to see our glorious inheritance that we have in Christ. What is he trying to tell you? There is something bigger than what we are living in now. The current situation we have is not our final destiny. When we leave this world, where we go is our final destiny. And we have a glorious inheritance in Christ Jesus where we will stand before the living God and be rewarded 
for having taken a stand for truth and righteousness to the point that when we get there, we will have probably forgotten everything we face down here. What Paul refers to this light affliction that we are facing and endure here is nothing compared to what we will receive when we stand before God. This life is really short. Dell and I have been talking about this over and over recently because of the loss of family members. We've gone through uh, four or five just in the last two years that have left us somewhat devastated and shocked and stunned that this has transpired. Some of them we saw it happening gradually. Some of them have taken a, a while, but some of them were overnight, and it has been a stunning shock. But we recognize that it tells us this world is not the end. This is not our home. We're passing through. And we pass through or on at different stages in our life. The book of uh, Psalms, chapter 116, verse 15, I mentioned, Blessed in the sight of God is the, is the death of his saints. It's precious in the sight of God. There's another verse, I think it's chapter 56, that says, My days were numbered before I lived the first one. So God knows when we are supposed to go on and be with him. He's in control of this life, and he has a reward for us in the next one. And that's what we should be focusing our eyes on is this next life. That is what Paul was saying, that this light affliction has nothing to compare to what's going on and that we need to get our eyes on the glorious inheritance that we have in Christ. Jesus told the church of Laodicea they were blind and needed an eye salve, Revelation 3.18. Matthew Henry said that the way to spiritual sight is to give up the wisdom and the reasoning of this world, which binds us to the things of, uh, blinds us to the things of God. The reasoning, the mentality, the opinions that we watch in the news are blinding us to the truth of God's word and what God has to say. Let us examine ourselves by the rule of the word and pray earnestly for the teaching of his Holy Spirit to take away our pride, our prejudices, and our worldly lusts. That word lust is actually the word desires. What we have, des I had a desire this morning. I had a lust this morning when I bought donuts. I didn't yield. <laughs> I got the plain cake for me. <laughs> but I wanted the good one. I wanted the simmonimonim roll. <laughs> Hi, Ken. Pastor Ken. <laughs> <clears throat> if you guys weren't at the memorial service yesterday, you picked your own pocket because <laughs> there was at least two beautiful songs sung yesterday, one from Ken and one from Christy that were outstanding. And I, I was as proud as punch when, when both of them uh, did their solos. And I, this is great. I'm ready to go home, Lord. I did good. <laughs> My reward is complete. <laughs> <laughs> the word lust just means desires. Your desires can be anything. The, the, during these last few weeks as we've been driving down, <laughs> get off the subject. Uh, I have had desires. I wish we had a better car so that it didn't jar Della as we went down the road. And, and I thought, why did we buy such a cheap car? We should have bought the more expensive ones so she would be comfortable as we drive down the road. Because every little bump is just giving her pain. Um, Paul said in 2 Corinthians 10.4, Our weapons are not carnal but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. What strongholds? Evil strongholds. The strongholds that are in your work that we've been praying about. Strongholds that are in the government that we are praying about. This, this nation is the last bastion of... of next to Israel itself, of God's favor to man on planet Earth. We're, the, we're just about it. If once we go down, it's going to be Israel all by itself as far as a nation that claims God as their leader and their, their, uh, their, their trust is in Him. What strongholds? The evil mindset of satanic, demonic influences that are in the world, in your school, in your church, in your... Uh, stores that you go by, uh, and all of the, the compromises that are being made with every group of people who come in and think they are victims and demand to be uh, noticed and cowered to. And every, it's all over the place. Paul says in Romans 8, 1 through 4, 
we make daily choices to walk the carnal ways of the world or the spiritual ways of God. The carnal ways of the world and flesh leads to death. The ways of God through the Holy Spirit leads to eternal life. That's all found in Romans 8, verses 1 through 4. What do I need to do? I feel impressed to read that, and I was told twice to read it, so I'm going to read it and not pass it by. Okay. New King James, Romans 8, 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus. Period. Okay? The rest of that verse, if you have a, a translation like the New King James or King James, it adds some more stuff, but that was added by translators that came later. The, the statement is there's no condemnation, and that word condemnation in the Greek is katakrima, which means ultimate condemnation. Krima is, is judgment. We will be judged, but we won't lose our, our eternal soul. Katakrima, or katakrima, depending on how you want to pronounce it, means that's eternal judgment of damnation. And we don't have that in Christ Jesus. Verse 2, for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. What's he talking about? The law of Moses I'm set free from because the law of life through Christ Jesus and the Holy Spirit is eternal life. Verse 3, for what the law, the old, the law of Moses could not do because it was weak through the flesh. The law of Moses only worked when you obeyed it and you can't. And none of us ever have and no one ever has except Christ Jesus himself. No one's been able to keep the law of Moses. God gave the law of Moses to say, this is what I'm like. And if you can be like this, you can gain eternal life. And that's why Paul says in Romans chapter 4 that it was by faith that Abraham was counted with God's righteousness. Because if he was able to mine out of himself the righteousness of God he could stand before God and say you owe me eternal life because I have been able to live just like you but no one has done it Abraham didn't do it it was by faith he got righteousness it's by faith that we get righteousness we can't live the law because it depends on my ability to live it in order to succeed and gain eternal life of sinful flesh on account of sin and he condemned sin in the flesh Jesus condemned sin in the flesh. Not only did he take our sins and pay the price for them and forgive us of the sins that we committed the moment we received Christ, but he has still paid the price and forgiven us of the sins that we yet committed after we were saved because we, the definition of sin is not being like God. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And unless we are like the glory of God, we still fall short. We still, by definition, are sinners. And we need God's forgiveness. So that is true all the way up to the day that we leave this world and go into the presence of God. We still fall short of being like him. That's why John said, when we see him, we will be like him, for we shall see him as he is, and we will finally be perfected. Sanctification and righteousness and holy will, holiness will be fully ours, when we meet him face to face and he, by his grace, gives us himself and fully develops us into an immortal, incorruptible being. And that point is yet in the future. So in the meantime, I still mess up. Sorry. You know, you look at it. Oh, I don't like the way he spoke this morning. <laughs> we just got, well, you know, I'm sorry. <laughs> you know, it's just, that's John. Yeah, that's John. Okay, verse 4, that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. So what's happening? I listen and tune my ear to the voice of God's Holy Spirit. Just exactly what Elijah did when he was in the wilderness. The, the voice of God was not in a thunderstorm. The voice of God was not in an earthquake. The voice of God was not in a, storm, in, in a hurricane. But the voice of God came as a still small voice saying, walk this way, walk you in it. Okay. And I sit back. Okay. And I have seen this happen to myself on the web constantly. Don't look at that stuff. It's junk. Look at this other stuff. Okay. <laughs> and it's as simple as that. Don't watch this on TV because it's garbage. Oh, okay. It's that simple. 
It's that simple. You walk over and you see somebody, you're a stupid idiot. You, don't say that to them. Oh, okay. Hey, God bless you. <laughs> Hope you have a great day. <laughs> you know, you don't do what you want to do because that's part of the flesh. <laughs> huh? <laughs> God bless you, you stupid idiot. <laughs> You, 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 in the, I, you're probably not old enough to remember. Um, oh, what's what's his first name? Oh, the comedian from the '30s, W. C. Fields. Oh, yeah. Remember? You remember him? He'd always mumble under his breath something that was absolutely hilarious, and he told the story how he got that from his mother. She, she when they were living in New York, she would look out and she would say, "Hey, Mrs. Smith, how you doing?" Okay, how's your husband? Oh, he's under the weather. <laughs> he was under the table last night. And then, oh, sorry to hear that, you know. <laughs> and it was a reference to him getting drunk, you know, so he was under the table. And she would only say that to her kids and then talk nice to the neighbor. And so he ended up doing that as his routine. But we do that. We, we do that even ourselves still. <laughs> i got to get off that subject because I can say some things on tape I don't want to say. I'll be held accountable here. <laughs> Strongholds. Satanic, demonic influences in the world that are trying to influence you. What do I need to do? Give up worldly wisdom and reasoning. Consider the world and the people in it from God's perspective by the insight we have from the Word and the Holy Spirit. All the world sees is evil people, tragic circumstances, material pleasures, financial and social problems. That's the surface of the problem. How many of you have been seeing the, I would consider them or call them, which is a popular term now, conspiracy theory, theorists on the Maui fire? I mean, have you been seeing this? How it happened? Why it happened? Who's behind this? And what's going to happen with this? Have any of you seen this? No? Okay. Well, I'll just tell you, there's a bunch of it out there. And I've been, I don't know why, I've been seeing it and I listened and I thought, oh, that's interesting. That's the world talking. Why am I looking at that? I don't know. Curious. I fall into the same trap that I'm saying don't fall into. Yeah, that's the bottom line there, eh? The real problem is the spiritual world. Verse 12. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Oh, my goodness. Like I said, I could spend an hour on that. That's different levels of demonic activity that Satan is in control of that uh, attack us, that try to influence the world, that are involved in our business, involved in our, 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 our government, involved in our schools, that these demonic activities are prevalent throughout the real world. And it's getting more intense because the day is drawing close to the end when we will be taken out of here. Okay, We're seeing things that Jesus talked about that would happen at the second coming which is Matthew 24, we're seeing some of that stuff happening right now. And we haven't even had the rapture yet, right? So that tells you if that kind of stuff is starting to turmoil, this kind of stuff is starting to happen, which you know, that sounds kind of like this here. Well, you're right. It does sound like that stuff there. That means the rapture is even closer because the seven-year tribulation is going to be the fulfillment of this thing. One of the laws of, of prophecy is the law of double fulfillment. You will see something that sounds like a fulfillment of Scripture, but it isn't the complete one. It's a preliminary fulfillment. It's kind of like a warning flag. This is what it's going to be like when the real one hits. Okay, And one of the best, best uh, examples I have is Antiochus Epiphanes, Antiochus the Great, who was in control of the, the land of the Middle East, who came into Jerusalem and set up a statue to Zeus and had Olympic Games in the, the, the Temple Mount and sacrificed a pig on the altar of the Jews and took the blood and spread it all over the inside of the temple to God. Okay, And everybody points at him, oh, that's what Daniel was talking about, the Antichrist. No, that's an idea of what the Antichrist is going to do. He is yet to do it. Okay. By the way, when, when Judas Maccabeus, who was the leader of the Maccabean revolt, he and his sons, they pushed off this guy. Uh, just a handful of individuals were a, was able to defeat this great army 
and, and chased them off from Jerusalem. They went in to purify the temple and they had to have oil for eight days to do the proper uh, cleansing of the temple and they only had one day's supply. And that one day's supply lasted eight days. That's Hanukkah. That's the Festival of Lights every Christmas time. That's the celebration of that miracle. And it's the celebration of throwing off Antiochus Epiphanes, who was chased out of town, so to speak, by Judas Maccabeus. And you, don't, you know what? You're only going to find that in the Apocrypha. You know what I'm talking about Apocrypha? Mm -hmm. It's those books in between the, the Old Testament and New Testament, which your Catholic Bible still has, and the English Bible doesn't. The King James, when it was first written in 1611, had those books in it. That was the reason why the pilgrims didn't like King James, because he included the Catholic books of the Apocrypha in his translation. So they only used the Geneva Bible, written in Geneva, Switzerland, by John Calvin and the disciples of John Knox, and that was the Bible they brought with them over to, to the New World, not the King James Bible, just to let you know. I told myself not to go off track, but there we are. Okay, the last paragraph on page one. This is not a call to warfare. This is a fact of Christian life. I'm getting off track again, but I just thought it was funny. The, the, this this uh, guy was asked, uh, have you received your calling in life? He says, yeah, but it was, <laughs> it was put on uh, message forwarding. I missed it. <laughs> Something like that. And I didn't say it right. I'll... Try and say it right next time. <laughs> it was put on call forwarding. I, I missed the call. Uh, and anyway, the devil went to war with us. I just feel like that sometimes. Uh, the devil went to war with us the minute that we received Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. Satan has hated man since the day God created Adam. We were made in God's image, and Satan wants to stamp us out. Moreover, he wants to hurt God by turning us against God who condemn who will condemn our eternal soul so this is this is one way that satan can get back at god is getting us to doubt god to get us to mistrust god okay this warfare is in the spirit world heavenly places it's referred to satan is the ruler of the atmosphere and he has access to god in heaven according to second corinthians 4 ephesians 2 and job 1 it's people he uses for his purposes. Friends, the devil has a plan for your life. His plan is to steal, kill, and destroy. Satan is a liar and the father of lies and a murderer from the beginning, according to John 8 and John 10. But Jesus said, I am come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly, John 10:10. 10, 10. Now, verse 13 of Ephesians 6. Therefore, ask yourself, what is the therefore, therefore, right? Paul says in verse 11, stand. Verse 12, withstand and stand firm, according to the English. Uh, is that English? English Standard Version? Yeah. And verse 14 says, stand therefore. Why? Because 1 Peter 5, 8 says, because we must stay alert. Watch out for your great enemy, the devil. He prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Notice that the word devour means to gulp down to eat ravenously as a beast of prey. That's why Peter used the illustration like a lion who rips and tears ferociously to consume. That's what he wants to do to you and me. The world is filled with malicious, savage carnage of every sort. It has nothing to do with meeting human needs. It's unrestrained destruction, and that's the methodology of Satan. Now you know the baseness and the wanton cruelty of your enemy, so now you need to arm yourself with God's armament. Ephesians 6.14, stand therefore. And we've read the verses down to verse 18. Verse 14 says, uh, truth. Truth we find in John 17.17 17, when Jesus was praying. That John 17 is the Lord, real Lord's prayer. Okay, Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. Truth is God's word. Truth is not what I say it is. It's not what others say it is. Truth is what God says it is. Psalm 19, verses 7 through 14, David says, God's law is perfect. His testimony is solid and makes us wise. His word is more precious than fine gold, sweeter than the honeycomb. 
Then he prays that his thoughts and words will please God. The word sanctify means to be set apart for God's special pleasure and use. Set apart from the corruption of the world and for God's word, uh, use. This is, what the de- this is where the word for the definition of saint comes from. Saint is someone who is committed to and follows the Lord Jesus Christ and doesn't follow the world. You are a saint in his book. When Paul wrote to the Corinthian church, it was full of all kinds of problems. He called them saints because they had separated themselves from the world and were following the Lord, even though they were tripping up, falling down, getting back up. And the, the, the deal was they got back up after they fell. Sanctified, set apart. Truth is symbolically represented as a belt which both protects our abdomen and gathers up our garments, holding them fast and secured so that we can fight effectively. There's a lot of guys walking around that need a belt. For the the soldier, the belts of all things to hold all things together for a soldier, uh, that he, it holds it all snug so that we, if we take off our belt, we do it to relax. When we cinch it up, we do it for action. And uh, I remember one lady I used to work with, she says, thank God for spandex every lunch. You know, it's just, just <laughs> I thought it was great. But, uh, you know, w- when we eat too much, we loosen the belt. But if we're going to get out and start working in the yard, we cinch that belt up and we get with it. See, and that's the idea of fighting with the devil is cinch up the belt. And the belt is referred to truth. I'm trying to do something here that you probably haven't seen. And I hope I get it across. The weapon of warfare, God's armament is not a belt. It's truth. Truth is the first weapon of warfare. And truth is what's being attacked in colleges and universities and in our government to this day. When government officials in the administration are brought before congressional hearings and they are point blank asked a question, this is a yes or no answer. Did you or did you not? And they talk for five minutes and never get to the word yes or no. That is of the devil and that is avoiding truth. And that's what these congressional hearings of some of them are trying to get at. Truth is the first item of warfare against the enemy. Okay, don't get sidetracked with the idea of a belt. Get focused on the word and the meaning of truth. The world harasses saints to compromise their judgmental, critical Bible teachings. Why? Because the Bible teachings are true. Hey, you know, they said, oh, that your your teaching offends me. Well, it offended God. That's why he sent Jesus down here to die for the things that we do to the offended him. We offended him first, but he's one of the ones who has reached out to, to bring salvation to us. How are you going to reach the world today if you don't get along? OK, why be so dogmatic? Huh? That's the problem. It's always the Christian that compromises and accepts the world's ways. That's the problem we're facing today. Well, we need to we need to allow certain uh, social issues to come in. I, I, I was watching one. Um, I was watching a uh, uh, interview, believe it or not, with Joel Olstein, who was being criticized that he wouldn't stand up against the idea of of um, homosexual marriages. And he was just—he was being lambasted, and I—and I believed the the lambasting because I don't think that highly of Joel Osteen. Sorry, I believed a lie because I saw the interview, and he says I won't marry same sex, I won't perform a uh, funeral for same sex, I won't allow membership for same sex relationships. They can come to church. I love them. I want them to get saved. But they're living in sin. God calls in an abomination. This is Joel Osteen. Okay? So I've heard a lot of criticism, but this is what he was saying on TV. And I heard so many people, oh, he was interviewed and he said blah, blah, blah. No, he didn't. He stood for truth of Christian principles. And I was mad at myself for not checking it out, for having believed somebody's hatred of him. And somebody's going to do that to you too. But stay firm. Stay truthful. Hold up the blood-stained banner of Christ. 
Paul said, stand firm. Being a friend of the world is being an enemy of God. James 4, 4. How can righteousness be a partner with wickedness? How can light live with darkness? 2 Corinthians 6, 14. Righteousness, the Bible repeatedly talks about protecting your heart or having a spiritual change of heart. To the one who believes in him who justifies, his faith is counted as righteousness. Romans 4, 5. The Old Testament sacrifices didn't change the heart of the people, but faith in Jesus Christ has justified us and given us righteousness. He, we have a change of heart, a whole new way of thinking and doing. We have a change of hearts. Our nature has changed. We are no longer slaves to the flesh, but free to the spirit to serve God in righteousness. Paul said in Colossians 1.13, we have been delivered from the power of darkness and translated into Christ's kingdom. We get a change of heart through righteousness by the truth that has come to us. So there's two weapons, truth and righteousness that comes to us. How did, again, how did Abraham gain righteousness? By faith in what God had to say, not in what the world was telling him. This breastplate called righteousness protects your heart. Thank God for our Christian experiences. But we do not put on a breastplate of spiritual experiences. We put on God's righteousness, which comes by faith. We can no sooner battle against spiritual enemies in our own righteousness and our own experiences than a soldier or a policeman can go to war or fight crimes without his vest or his breastplate. You will be attacked. They will shoot at you. And I saw this last week where uh, two, men, two police officers in San Antonio... And within moments of each other at two different places were shot and they were the, the people were attempting to kill them. You know what saved them? Their Kevlar vest. And, and we need to have a Kevlar vest protecting our, our, our hearts and our Kevlar vest is the righteousness that we receive by faith in what God's word has to say. And it, the gospel of peace, uh, this, is, this is weapon number three, gospel of of peace. God's peace through the gospel message with mankind. Isaiah said, How beautiful are the feet of those who bring the good news of God's peace and salvation. Isaiah 52, 7. Sinners and saints alike must hear this news. Come to Jesus, the Savior of all mankind. God isn't mad at you anymore. It's through Christ Jesus that this againstness has been removed. Come boldly to the throne of God. You can be accepted into the family of God through Christ Jesus, Hebrews 4 and Ephesians 1. It's preparation of the gospel. This is the only verse in the Bible that uses a Greek word that has been translated here, preparation. It actually means a firm foundation or a firm footing. When I was playing football, we had cleats on the bottom of our shoes. And I was one of the characters because I was bigger than some of the other people that I was put on the front line. And I was told... You keep those guys from coming through to get to the quarterback. So you stand there with your feet firmly planted and your cleats dug in and you go, grr. <laughs> and you, you, you push these guys away. You keep them from getting to the quarterback. And this is what he's talking about. Get your feet firmly planted. Look the devil in the eye and say, grr. <laughs> okay? <laughs> okay. <laughs> It's a colloquialism. It means to take a stand, to set your feet firmly. The New Revised Version says, put on whatever will make you ready to proclaim the gospel of peace. Be ready to share the gospel of peace. Make peace with anybody. Uh, I was talking about an individual who a number of years ago um, had, a, had uh, personally attacked me as a, uh, as a leader in the church who recently I saw and came to me and apologized. Ha ha, love you. Yeah, consider it forgotten and, and it's water under the bridge. Okay, it's a whole new beginning between me and this guy. Happy, happy, happy. Okay, it, it, gospel of peace in an instant. Okay, yeah, it's all forgotten. Let's, let's move on. The message says, the message, <coughs> be prepared. <coughs> You're up against far more then you can handle on your own. Take all the help you can get. Boy, that's pretty good, huh? Every weapon of God has 
that God has issued so that when it's all over but the shouting, you'll still be on your feet. Truth, righteousness, peace, faith, salvation are more than just words. Learn how to apply them. That's what we're doing here. So, the, the gospel of peace. We have uh, what, what, what we talked about first was truth, righteousness, and the gospel of peace. Now, next is faith, which Paul calls a shield. Now, can I tell you something about this? I never really realized this until I did a study, and, and you'll get caught up in this. If the guy, if, if a teacher talks about this for two or three weeks, he will tell you that the shield that is being talked about here is as big as a door. It was a monster. You actually had to have somebody carry it for you, and you would hide behind it. Every bit of you would hide behind this shield. And it was a monstrous thing. I mean, okay, so we've got on our belt, we've got our breastplate, we've got our sword, we've got our shoes, and what are we doing? We're hiding behind a door so we don't get hurt. And that door is faith. Okay? Take the shield of faith and take the helmet of salvation. Okay? Now, it's it, uh, in this righteousness that we have and in the shield that we have. Uh, we pray in verse 18. The thoughts and feelings and imaginations and fears and lies, all of these can be hurled at us by Satan as fiery darts. This is where a lot of you, you and me get caught up. We start thinking the way the world thinks. And this is satanic. Okay? The way the world thinks is the way Satan causes them to think. We let our feelings get away from ourselves and our imaginations go cuckoo. It keeps you up in the middle of the night going through conversations with somebody you don't like five, ten, fifteen times. You go through the same thing over two or three hours. If you don't do it, I'm a weirdo. Because I think I, I know I do it and I figure everybody else does too. Okay? De, uh, Della says, where do we get all these stupid dreams from? I says, I have no idea, but that's going to be one of my questions when we get to heaven. Now, I want to know how come I'm thinking all these stupid dreams in the middle of the night. And I wake up in a cold sweat. What was that all about? I've been good. How come I have to have stupid dreams like this? Uh, get away, devil. Okay. Uh, <laughs> faith suppresses and stifles all of these fears, these lies, the imaginations, I, my own feelings, and the stupid thoughts that go into my head. You can't help but think stupid thoughts, but you can keep from continuing to think about them. You can't keep a bird out of your tree, but you can keep that bird from making a nest in the tree. You can chase him off. That's what I do at my house when the pigeons show up. I get rocks and throw it at them, and they, they go away, just to let you know. God told Abraham, I am your shield and your exceeding great reward, Genesis 15.1. David said in Psalm 84, the Lord is our son and he is our shield. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 13, 13, love is the greater than hope, than faith and hope. But here in Ephesians, Paul says that faith is the preeminent to all of the other graces. That's why I made a point out of saying you got this sword, which is the, the word of God. You've got the helmet of salvation. You've got the breastplate of righteousness. You got your feet shod with the gospel of peace. You have all of this stuff and yet you're hiding behind with all of those things, you're hiding behind this door. And that door is faith. So faith is preeminent in all of this. Okay? It's, it's, the, it's the primo number one piece of armament to ward off the attacks of the enemy. Likewise, faith in God is an indispensable part of God's armor. Okay? So what we have talked about, truth, righteousness, peace, and faith. Now we go on to salvation. Like a helmet protects the head in this illustration, salvation protects our minds. We are saved by grace. We didn't gain salvation by works, neither can we keep it by works. One of Satan's most effective weapons against us is discouragement. The helmet of salvation protects us against discouragement, against the desire to give up, giving us hope not only in knowing that we are saved, but that we will be saved and continue to be saved now and eventually one day when we stand before God we will be fully saved 
You understand we're all on a road progressively in God's uh, economy becoming more saved and more durable in our uh, work against the enemy, more proficient and, and more resolved to serve God until one day we are wholly saved, wholly sanctified, and wholly delivered in His presence. It is this assurance that God will triumph and so will we. When we are properly equipped with the helmet of salvation, it's hard to stay discouraged. So salvation is our next weapon. And then the Word of God. The Word of God is our next to last weapon of God's armament. It's a sword. The Word is sharper than any two-edged sword. The idea is that the Spirit provides a sword for you, that the sword is the Word of God. To effectively use the word sword of the Spirit, we can't uh, regard the Bible as a book of Proverbs, cliches, or magic charms. This is the very word of God Almighty, the creator and the king of the universe. If we are not confident in, uh, in inspiration of scripture that the sword really came from God's Holy Spirit, then we will not use it effectively. A soldier that doesn't have confidence in his weapons is defeated before he goes into battle. i got five minutes and then I have to shut up. And Pastor Ken and Christy need to get ready for the next service pretty quick. Oh, you guys are helping me back there. Oh, go. you're going to go? Oh, okay. Thank you. Thank you. God bless you both. Ken's doing triple duty today. <laughs> the very Word of God, God Almighty, the Creator and the King of the universe. That's what this Bible is. Okay? Um, if we understand that this is God's Holy Spirit speaking to us and that He has given us this power and this ability to, to fight against the enemy, then we can use it correctly. A soldier that doesn't have confidence in his weapons is deforted, defeated before he even goes into battle. You need to read your word. You need to trust your word, believe the word, hang on to the word, repeat the word, and, and proclaim the word at every opportunity that you have in your life. Use the word of God to fight off what is happening in your life that you find that is, is, is going against you, that is causing you to be discouraged or defeated in your mind. Look for the promises of God that are available to you in God's Word. Start reading the Psalms. It's full of promises of God's deliverance. Not only did the Spirit give us the Scriptures, but also He makes them alive to us or, or us alive to them. He equips us with it. You know, I... I I've been, I've been a teacher since I was 25. That's 57 years ago I, when I was 25 and I started teaching adults. Okay, You know what? I'm still finding stuff that I didn't notice before. Almost every week. Thing, I've been teaching for 57 years. And this, this beautiful book, this Word of God, is an, an incredible life adventure. It's great. Every soldier first practices the use of his weapons before going into battle. When Jesus was 12 years old, he surprised the teachers with his knowledge of God's word. That means he was learning it even when he was a, a, a toddler. Jesus practiced his knowledge on the word before he actually needed to use it like a sword when he faced Satan in the wilderness. He did have to. He did have to face Satan in the wilderness, and so will you. And you need to know the word of God in order to fight off what he throws at you. God will be with you, and he'll help you remember. Jesus told the uh, the disciples, don't worry about what you're going to say to the governor when you are brought up on charges. The Holy Spirit will give you the words to say and you will have the victory through Christ Jesus in his name. That is, that is absolutely a promise of God. In verses 18 to 20, Paul tells us how to use our spiritual strength and the armor of God. He says, pray always with all prayer. We should use every kind of pray, prayer prayer that we can think of. Group prayer, individual prayer, silent prayer, shouting prayer, walking prayer, kneeling prayer, eloquent prayer, groaning prayer, constant prayer, fervent prayer, 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 prayer. Pray. Just pray. Okay? Uh, <clears throat> you ever heard anybody shout prayers? I have. Evangelists. It's almost like it, you, God's not deaf, but boy, are they getting with it. And they're making sure the devil understands what, where they stand. <laughs> they love it. In conclusion, Paul tells us to stand, withstand and stand therefore. Then he says, pray, 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 pray with all kinds of prayers. Jesus told us as we face these calamitous last days, we should watch and pray, watch and pray. Matthew 24, 42. 
Be always on the watch and pray that you may be able to escape all that is about to happen and that you may be able to stand before the Son of Man. See, it's a bigger problem than just what's going on. Our souls are at stake and the souls of men are at stake. Those that we know that are unsaved, their very soul is at stake that, uh, that we can stand. Pray that we have the ability, the strength, the knowledge, the, the trust, the faith that we can stand against what's going on in this world. It's almost like a flood is coming against us, but the word of God says that his name is a banner that resists the flood of the enemy and he will deflect it for us that he, he Jesus promised that where I am there you may be also John 14 3 for our citizenship is in heaven from which also we eagerly wait for a savior the Lord Jesus Christ Philippians 3 even so come Lord Jesus Revelation 22 our focus our goal our purpose our mindset mindset should be on the eternal not on the world Colossians chapter 3 verse 1 says, Since you have been risen in Christ Jesus, you're now spiritually seated with Him in heavenly places. Seek those things which are above. Don't worry about the things that are here on earth. They're transient. They're temporary. They fade away like fog does in the morning. That it, They're temporary. And we don't have to worry about what this world is doing, what's popular or what it's going through, because we have an eternal weight of glory, an eternal home in heaven. Quickly, come quickly, Lord. Make all things new. Redeem the church, your bride. With longing eyes, we look for you. For home is at your side. Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name, we ask the blessing of your word upon each one of us that we might grow in truth and in faith for the name of Christ, to the glory of God, for the furtherance of the kingdom, and for the salvation of others. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen and amen. God bless you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Christy, for all your help. Thank you, everybody, for coming.